Good afternoon to everybody and a warm welcome uh, to the many Africa Center alumni who have joined us for today's webinar entitled, Why Does Rule of Law Matter for Security Sector Effectiveness? My name is Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly, and I am the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And I'm pleased to be opening this webinar. Although we cannot all see each other today, let me commend the enthusiasm of the alumni community that has joined us this morning. You represent many different countries across the continent with a variety of experiences in security and justice domains with military and civilian backgrounds. So welcome to everybody. And welcome to this webinar, which is the first in a quarterly series of discussions that the Africa Center will hold throughout 2022 on strengthening security sector effectiveness and the role that rule of law can play in doing that. The schedule for the rest of the series was enclosed in the invitation we sent you for this webinar, and all Africa Center alumni with an interest in these topics are always welcome. Before we introduce the objectives of the webinar for today, and begin the discussion, let me turn it over to our director, Ms. Kate Almquist Knopf for remarks. Well, thank you, Kat, and uh, good day uh, to everyone joining us uh, and uh, watching online. Uh, welcome uh, to all of our uh, Africa Center alumni, distinguished colleagues and friends. Uh, we're really delighted to, to have you with us uh, for this webinar. Now, as many of you know, the Africa Center serves as a forum for research, for academic programs, and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a U.S. Department of Defense Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. And we carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. And recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchange, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. By engaging together military and civilian, government and civil society, as well as national, regional, and international, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. In this kind of dialogue, infused with real-world experiences and fresh analysis, we hope provides an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. So thank you uh, once again for joining us uh, for this discussion today on uh, effectiveness of security sector and rule of law. Uh, I'm really delighted to, uh, and looking forward to, to the conversation with our panelists uh, and uh, uh, the discussion afterwards. Thank you so much. Back to you, Kat. Thanks, Kate. In this webinar, in terms of the objectives, we hope to discuss what rule of law is as a principle and as a process. We hope to consider how factors related to rule of law, rights, and security force professionalism can influence security dynamics in Africa. We also hope to share experiences that demonstrate some of the strategic benefits of bringing the rule of law into security sector responses to different threats and challenges. And finally, we hope um, to analyze the practical challenges that security sector leaders face to investing in rule of law systems with checks and balances to advance people-centered security. Let me now introduce our academic dean, Dr. Luca byung dang Kuo, who will moderate the panel and the question and answer session. He has many distinctions, both in academia and in public service, including having served as Minister of Presidential Affairs for the Government of South Sudan and as National Minister of Cabinet Affairs for the Republic of Sudan. So with that, Dr. Luca, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Akkad, my colleague Akkad, and, uh, and for all of you who join us today. And as um, our director mentioned, this is the first line of work uh, for the Africa Center. How can the uh, rule of law enhance effectiveness in, uh, in the security sector? So, so my role is really to moderate today. I'm pleased to welcome two or three highly, including my colleague Akkad, uh, highly ex experts on the field of the rule of law and, and the security sector. Since you have the bios and uh, on the web 
on the webinar's website uh, and, and also being posted in the Zoom chat. So I will just highlight a few pertinent points about each of them. And let me start with General, I mean, General Kiel. He is the deputy commander of the National Gendarmerie and deputy director of military justice. He is a specialist in peace and security issues, rule of law and good governance, police reform, and the protection of civilians in conflict zones. He teaches at the Institute of Human Rights and Peace of the Sheikh Anta Diop University of Dakar. And, and also he teaches at the Center for Advanced Studies in Defense and Security known at Sheds. He was a member of the Scientific Committee of the, of the Dakar International Forum on Peace and Security in Africa. He carried out several United Nations field missions, both in Senegal, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Haiti. And he earned his PhD in law from the University of Sheikh Anta Diop of Dakar and a graduate of the National Defense University, our university here, College of International Security Affairs in Washington. So he's a very seasoned person to talk on this issue on operational and also in at theoretical level. So General Tiao, you are most welcome and we are so delighted having you today. And I believe our participants will learn a lot from you. The second panelist is Dr. Ibrahim Wani. He is an independent consultant is specializing in international human rights, transnational justice, governance, and institutional reform and capacity building. He serves as the director of the human rights divisions at the United Nations Mission in South Sudan. He serves as the representative of the United Nations Human Commissioner for Human Rights in South Sudan, Eastern Africa, and to the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. He was a professor of law at the University of Virginia and the University of uh, Missouri in the United States of America. Importantly, and for us in the Africa Center, he also served as the academic dean, my position, uh, at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies in Washington. Uh, he started his early career uh, in, uh, as a foreign service officer in the diplomat diplomatic service in Uganda. So really, really, and he received his Bachelor of Law from Makara University in Uganda and Master and Doctor of Law from the University of Virginia in the United States of America. So Dr. Wani, you are so delighted that you are back home to, to the Africa Center with such a very important issues of the rule of law. So we are so delighted and honored having you back to the Africa Center. You have been with us even earlier. Then let me introduce also my colleague, um, uh, Catherine uh, Kelly. We will call him her Cat, you know, for the for the abbreviation, this is how we know her. We would like you also to know her in that name because she, I think she's comfortable with that name as well. Uh, she, she is an associate professor of justice and rule of law at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And she's also a term member of the Council on Foreign Affairs in the United States of America. I think I just want to remind you this council is extremely very important. And for us, having her as a term member is a privilege. And uh, it's a big, it's a big uh, advantage for the Africa Center. And she served also as an advisor at the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative. And she has extensively published on democracy, governance, and security in Africa, both in terms of books, form, and in policy and academic uh, journals. And she holds her PhD in government from Harvard University. So we are happy. And she's the faculty lead of this program, which I think is very important that she is with us today. Let me, as Kate, as Kat, Kat mentioned, uh, it will be conversational. This, this, uh, this issue of rule of law. This is a concept that has been there, and, uh, but it needs to be anchored to be meaningful in terms of how it is related to the security, uh, to, the, uh, to the security sector. And as you could see from the title of this webinar, how can security sector, how can the uh, rule of law enhance the effectiveness of security sector? But I want to start with my colleague, uh, Akkad. And based on her extensive work on this area of rule of law, and, uh, and I would like her really to provide us in a simple way, some of the key features of the rule of law that make it important for security sector effectiveness. 
And I will appreciate if you can do such a thing and uh, mean this response and explaining this feature within uh, six minutes. Uh, Dr. Kelly, you are most welcome. Thanks, Dr. Luca. In a nutshell, uh, rule of law is both a principle and a process. So in terms of principles, rule of law is the idea that all people are treated equally under the law, regardless of who they are. Thus, the rule of law is meant to contrast with the concept of rule by law, which is a mode of governing in which those in political power use the law to constrain the behavior of other people, but not their own behavior. In terms of process, Rule of law is not just about security and justice officials enforcing the law. Rule of law is also about making the equality of everyone under the law a real tangible thing in everyday life. And in that sense, building the rule of law is an ongoing social and political process involving the state, including the security forces, as well as citizens. It hinges upon those state officials forging relationships of trust and reciprocity with citizens based on relevant local, national, or international standards about rules, rights, and redress. So in other words, ensuring the equality of everybody under the law, not only in principle, but also as a practice, is a core part of governments establishing and maintaining a social contract with citizens. Now to expand a bit on these ideas, rule of law has a variety of key components that make it what it is. So I'll name a few here. First, countries with robust rule of law have laws and policies that are clear, well-known, and internally consistent. This is sometimes what legal scholars refer to as legal certainty, or the idea that you can anticipate what the consequences of any given behavior or choice you might make might be, as long as you understand what the law says. And in that sense, transparency about the law and the law's application is also an important part of the rule of law. The content of the laws also matters, of course. Countries e with robust rule of law. Outros detalhes também são importantes para o Estado de Direito. Countries with robust rule of law have constitutions and legislation that uma, offer equal protection uma, of freedoms and liberties. O Estado de Direito tem a Constituição e uma proteção igual. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm hearing a little bit of the Portuguese translation line. I don't, don't know if others are having that issue as yeah. well. English line. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, can you go ahead? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think that's an sure. I think we'll fix it. So, as I was saying, um, this is the second thing here that's important is that the contents of the law matters as well. So, countries with robust rule of law have constitutions and legislation that offer equal protection of freedoms and liberties for all citizens, and proportionality, i.e., the degree of punishment being appropriate for the degree of offense in criminal law, for example, is also a notable aspect of the law's content here. Some African countries have ratified international conventions that affirm some of these principles. Similarly, many have signed on to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. The African Charter on Democracy, Elections, and Governance also promotes rule of law principles like equality in the exercise of various freedoms and liberties. In addition, citizens' practical access to state and non-state options for justice are also part of the rule of law. So ideally, every citizen has a range of justice options that they can choose to use if they encounter a problem, and if they have good knowledge of the pros and cons of pursuing those different options, they can effectively uh, make good choices that suit them within the justice system. And then finally, the extent to which justice institutions operate fairly and independently also matters. Countries with robust rule of law systems have systems of checks and balances, between the executive branch, the legislature, and the judiciary. And this allows the judiciary to function independently of what are often very strong executive branches in Africa. And that helps to ensure the equitable and consistent application of the law to everyone, whether they are someone in government or someone outside of it. I will point out that the African Union's Agenda 2063 further advances a vision based on this by calling for an Africa where people, quote, enjoy affordable and timely access to independent courts and judiciaries that deliver justice without fear or favor. So to sum up, rule of law prevails when there is a widespread sense that everyone is subject to the rules and there are practical mechanisms in place to ensure their application. Leaders are subject to oversight by other leaders in other branches of government, as well as to oversight by citizens who are not in government. And people must also have sufficient access to justice to hold each other to account. And that requires a certain degree of fundamental freedoms and civil liberties that ensure that all citizens are working under the law on a level playing field. 
That leads us to the question of why rule of law, as we're defining it here, matters for security sector effectiveness. And just briefly, the short answer is because justice and rule of law are vital for peace and stability, which is the security sector's job to help provide. Part of the foundation for peace and stability is a high level of trust between security actors and citizens. Mistrust of security forces can sometimes exist as a result of historical legacies of security force abuses, perceptions of institutional corruption, rightful or not, uh, or even frustration with slow responses to crimes. Security forces can do their jobs better when the people that they are meant to serve trust them. And fostering popular confidence in the security sector therefore hinges upon building rights respecting relationships with citizens. It hinges upon providing citizens human security. And it hinges upon enabling citizens to exercise their rights and express their views peacefully, even if they disagree with the government. Now, these are not always easy duties to fulfill, but as we will hear from the other panelists, there are some major strategic benefits to the security sector operating in accordance with the rule of law, both internally within defense institutions and externally in terms of their everyday interactions with citizens. So overall, more transparent, legitimate, and accountable security forces gain greater trust of the populace, and they can in turn address threats and challenges in more lasting and sustainable ways. So I'll leave my answer there. Hopefully it was within the time, Dr. Luca. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much uh, uh, Kat, for the uh, such elaborate uh, feature. But I, uh, one thing I guess want to take away from this one, that the rule of law can provide predictability of the behavioral state. And it is a process through which you can forge a social contract between the citizen and the state, and indeed between the security sector and the citizens around uh, the human security and citizen center security. And that can only be forged by a respect of rule of law. And I think that's a very, a very important. Thank you very much for anchoring also to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, vision 2063 that is actually underlining the importance of the rule of law. Let me move now to Dr. Wani. Uh, although this feature as provided by, by Dr. Kelly and the, uh, the importance of the rule of law for the effectiveness of the security sector, maybe we may need also to really sharpen it and zoom in in uh, some of these challenges facing such, such, uh, such uh, feature in introducing the rule of law to the security sector. And there is often a perceived tension or trade off between human rights and security. You know, whenever you talk about security, the human and, and security, they seem to be you know, these other things not going to, uh, together. And could you explain why this is the case or not? And please provide cases that concrete example to illustrate this, this either threat of or a synergy between the human rights and security. Uh, please, you are welcome, uh, Dr. Wani. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Luca Dion. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. You have asked uh, a very fundamental critical question, and in the little space that is given, I will try to zero in on some of the key issues. And I, I take off from where Professor Kelly uh, left and, and focused our presentation on what the principles of the rule of law are. And, and, and if you just begin to deconstruct and understand what she talked about, about the key principles here of certainty, predictability, transparency, everybody governed by the law, and so on. It should seem fairly obvious that uh, the simple answer to your question is there shouldn't be any tension. Because, uh, first of all, there's a complementarity of purposes here. When you talk about issues of protection of freedom, and liberty, including life, uh, those in many ways should be the things that uh, security should be. Uh, concern uh, about. Uh, so in, in, in principle, as I said earlier, there shouldn't be any, any tension at all uh, between the two. That referred to Agenda 2063. It does, in fact, underscore the significance of rule of law, not only for security, but also for development and, and the, the synergy uh, among uh, all three. Uh, in an earlier study done by the World Bank in 2018, something called the Pathways for Peace, uh, the study states the proposition that security and just institutions that operate fairly and in alignment with the rule of law are essential to preventing violence and sustaining peace. 
And indeed, I think the experience uh, around not only Africa, but globally does suggest uh, very, very strongly that uh, some of the drivers for insecurity and for conflict are related to the absence of the rule of law. And if you look at all, almost all of the uh, revolutionary movements and opposition to government in Uganda, in, in, in Rwanda, in Ethiopia, under Mengistu, almost all of them had this underlying sense of injustice and mistreatment and absence of equality as the basis for the actions that they took leading therefore to a change of government. So in, in a sense, I, I think my, my simple answer there is, in principle, there shouldn't be. But you're also absolutely right that there are uh, contradictions and there's a perceived tension that goes back a very long time. It starts from uh, the history. I think uh, Pat already alluded to some of that, uh, beginning with the colonial period where uh, the law was used as an instrument of control. Security, similarly, was instrumentalized in that sense as, a, as an instrument of, of, of control. Shortly after independence, uh, we had a very, very brief period of uh, euphoria and excitement about independence and freedoms and so on. But very, very quickly, we moved into one party states and military leadership, which were characterized uh, by uh, very, very repressive uh, regimes. We had countless examples from uh, Idi Amin in Uganda, Bukhasa in Central African Republic, Mubutu, Wema, Haile Mariam uh, in, in, in Ethiopia. Uh, and so on. Uh, and, and that sort of flipped a very significant uh, perspective here with respect to the dimension, the, the perspective on security. The focus shifted to uh, the protection of this one party state. Security was uh, perceived as the security of the regime. The primary focus of the security sector uh, was to secure the regime. Any opposition uh, to, 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 to that uh, was character was seen as uh, subversive and was very, very harshly dealt with. Uh, these periods were characterized by gross violations of, uh, of human rights. Bottom line is, uh, the result of this was a significant level of mistrust uh, between security and human rights. The human rights community and activists and citizens generally were alienated, did not perceive consider themselves as uh, protected by security and the security element because of the kind of role that they, they, they play also were very suspicious and mistrustful of uh, actors and civilians and, and, and so on. Uh, now, military regime ended with the period in the late 80s and 90s when we moved towards uh, a period of democratization. And for a brief period there, one would have thought, okay, that, that has now been sorted out. Unfortunately, I think we, we, we reverted back very quickly. Uh, again, I'm sorry here to generalize. This does not apply to every country, but I can say with confidence that in the majority of African countries, this was the tendency. Constitutions were amended. Uh, we started having uh, sort of constitutional dictatorships uh, across the, 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 the continent. The security sector was con continued to be instrumentalized and to serve the purposes of the, of the regime. Uh, this was accompanied at the same time by very draconian laws. Uh, public order management acts, uh, laws related to criminal libel, uh, restrictions on civil society, uh, the judiciary, judicial independence was undermined, uh, uh, and on the economic side, failure to deliver on very basic uh, services, corruption, marginalization of communities, increased public discontent and dissatisfaction, and so on. And more importantly, security was instrumentalized in all these regards, and the security sector was consistently used as the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the mechanism for enforcing some of these elements. And that, of course, then continued to reinforce uh, the, uh, the, the, the mistrust and the tension between security and the rule of law, unfortunately. Uh, and the final point I would make simply here is that, uh, uh, unfortunately, of course, when the security sector intervened characteristically, uh, very, very coercive use of uh, violence, uh, including extrajudicial killings in, uh, in, in many instances. So in some, uh, the relationship is very tense indeed. It is very unfortunate. And as I hope we will elaborate on a little bit later, that has undermined not only uh, the rule of law, but it has also had a very uh, corrosive effect on the state.
Thank you. Yeah, yeah Dr. Rwani, uh, I thank you very much for elaborating this, the synergy. There's no perceived threat of actually there's a lot of synergy. But the practice has shown that there is this creative tension. And I think I like the way you said even the uh, the vision 20, that is, I mean 63, is clearly emphasizing the importance of the rule of law in the security and the provision of development. But I think the most important point is what you said, and I think I always uh, uh, highlight the uh, what uh, Kofi Annan to see this synergy and complementarity between security, development, and the human right. When he said the humanity cannot enjoy development without security, and it cannot enjoy security without development, and it can just, cannot enjoy both without human rights. So I think you highlighted very well the, uh, the, uh, the issue. And I think what you said also, the issue of moving away from a state-centric or regime-centric of security to the citizen-centric security. I think the moment we have that understanding, then we can be able to move to see the nurturing, the, uh, the security as a very, very important component with the security sector. Let me now move to Dr. Thiao. Thiao. And I think you have a lot of good experience on the ground and you have a very good theoretical and academia in terms of your understanding of these issues. And I would like you really to provide us with some example from your own work as uh, a gendarmerie that to illustrate the strategic gains that security sector leaders enjoy when they bring the rule of law and professionalism into their work. Uh, could you also speak to ways the Senegal is still working to improve the rule of law and its security sector, as well as the security sector accountability to citizens? In simple terms, really, Dr. Thiel, we would like you really to anchor some of these issues raised by uh, Dr. Kelly, by Dr. Rwani, to the practical experience in the, in the Senegalese context. Uh, please, you are most welcome, Dr. Thiel. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kelly, Dr. Luca, Dr. Wani. Hello. It is, I am delighted and honored to be here today with you. It's afternoon here in Dhaka, uh, and this is an extremely interesting issue and very important. Uh, it, the inclusion of this concept is, is essential in Africa. Uh, so this is a very, a very pertinent subject. There's a lot of international text, legal text that are in play, that are, that exists, but that must be implemented. So to get straight to the issue, I will recall a few legal rules that are uh, specific to the forces of security forces, because the issue of stability in Africa, we, we've seen many issues originated from security forces. And so they must integrate these legal concepts in their daily activities. So I will talk about a few legal texts uh, beyond the African Charter on Human Rights. Uh, there's the Geneva Convention, of course, that we all know about. Um, the 1984 Convention Against Torture, uh, the Statutes of Rome, um, there's a lot of UN texts about the basic principles on the use of, of uh, weapons by those who are in charge of applying laws. Um, and then the use of force, uh, it defines the force that can be used because the forces of def defense forces, security forces have this responsibility to, to use force in a legitimate way. And this must be supported by the rule of law within the state. Now to go back more specifically to West Africa, there's the African uh, Charter for uh, Proper Governance. Uh, so, you know, there's ECOWAS, which establishes uh, rules for rule of law, 
and protocols for democracy and good governance. So ECOWAS is a community institution that imposes on states the duty to have a certain type of conduct in terms, it's a code of conduct that was adopted in 2011, but that I think is perhaps not specific enough. It really um, is supposed to establish relations between the civilian side and the military side. But so defenders of human rights generally have a lot of conflicts with security forces. This may be due to the fact that the responsibilities of each side are not well understood. Now, in terms of Senegal, the constitution of Senegal from 2001 um, requires the respect of the rule of law uh, in a state within which citizens are under uh, the supervision of independent judicial sector. Now, the security forces, which are state institutions in general, must be subject to these rule of law rules. Now, to come back to the question in a more specific manner, what are the gains uh, in the improvement of the efficiency of security forces? What, what are the gains to be made? in including these rule of law principles to, to improve this efficiency. I'll give you two examples. Recently in Senegal, uh, legislators adopted um, this concept of the presence of the attorney. So this is, our, this is for democratic control of, of crowds. Now, there is there is the reform of the right to an attorney when while is in while you one is in detention. So someone is arrested because they are suspected of having committed an infraction. They are held for 48 hours under the control of a magistrate, of course. During these 48 hours that they are detained, there is an investigation. Prior to this, an attorney could not intervene in this situation. Um, and for many years, uh, human rights activists were trying to integrate this concept. Um, but there was a lot of reluctance on, on the part of the security forces. They would say, if we bring uh, attorneys within uh, police stations, it's really going to complicate everything. It's going to slow down the process. It's really actually going to detract from efficiencies. They, they, they really felt that bringing in an attorney would um, reduce efficiency. Nevertheless, it's been imposed. And in practice, we've realized that when the attorney comes in, um, actually the police feels much more confident. And that we have, what we have seen um, in the past is that officers in the judiciary police uh, felt they, they had issues because if there was a death while someone was in detention, this would create a lot of issues. Now they've realized that having an attorney come in actually creates uh, more pro protection for them. They, they feel much more confident about their work, and that means that the procedures are improved. So integrating these rules, uh, the, these rule of law, has actually had a positive effect. Now, another example in my work as in the gendarmerie and the police, there is the respect of regula regulatory rules in, in the control of crowds uh, to keep order when there are crowds gathered. So say there is a confrontation between citizens who have the right to protest, the right to express their dissatisfaction, the right to express their opinion, faced with security forces that are required to maintain order. And so that peace is maintained. So security forces, from our point of view in, in Senegal, call on the presence of civil authority to 
it has to be the civil authority has to order the use of force, uh, not the military authorities. So they have to establish the proper procedure. So if a citizen protests in a slightly violent way, have a right to be warned that security forces may intervene. They, ha they have to be warned, and this has to be very visible. Then the defense and security forces have the obligation to gradually introduce the use of force. Um, so for example, protesters block a road. They, they, has to be, they have to be slowly warned that there may be um, more use of force as they go. So here are some examples of how uh, the defense and security forces have really improved Okay. their integration of the rule of law. No, no, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thiel, for this good, concrete example. And I like the idea of how the presence of attorney uh, in, the, in, the, in the police service could enhance the effectiveness and confidence of the, uh, of this, of the security. I like also what you said, and I think this is an issue of the crowd and the protest and how the decisions of the use of force to be vested through the due process of law in the civilian rule rather than the military. I think this is a good example because what we are seeing in Africa now is a very many cases of uh, riot and then uh, protests. And I think it is needed to be handled within the context of rule of law. I really appreciate that. And I would like, yes, only the participants in case you have questions as you could see in the conversation, you can type in your questions through the chat function and uh, in both English, I mean, in, in English, French, and Portuguese, and so that you can handle them. While we're waiting for the question and answer, you have the right now to do those. Let, let me move now, even a bill on the, your, um, let me move now to the, um, to Dr. Thiao again. I think because you have to have your experience in Senegal, but you have experience also in peacekeeping missions on the continent. And I think it is good also to move you a bit beyond Senegal to the continent, especially your work as a police a mission in the DRC with the UN and also your role in protection of civilian and human rights in the crisis situation. And could you provide also in the way you did it, an example based on your work on how the, uh, your work demonstrate the complementarity and the synergy between the rule of law and security. And if you can provide some of the challenges uh, of using rule of law to advance citizen security. So please, you are most welcome uh, to Tiao within six minutes, please. The, the very unique context of the DRC is, as we know, is that unfortunately, there is a lot of instability, you have war in the East, you have armed conflicts. And for a very long time, the UN has been there, present in the country, actually the entire international community. There are other partners present. And they, they're attempting to help the Congolese government to really bring in, establish some form of stability. I'll first talk about the challenges because th th that is the real issue. It's an en enormous challenge uh, to establish within a country that is, is in, in crisis to integrate these principles of the rule of law. You know, you uh, talked about Senegal when uh, attorneys started coming in as soon as someone was arrested, um, where a document was issued by the government that said uh, as soon as someone is arrested they have the right to an attorney and and but you know Senegal has stability we don't have war now in a much more complicated context a much more complicated situation in uh, the DRC where the the UN has been present for years the enormous challenge has been to train the security in defense forces a regarding these principles. And that's, um, I worked in a police development or a reform of Congolese police department and external partners as an aggregate would in, at coordinated by the UN were attempting to apply, bring in 
a lot of resources, a lot of commitment to integrate these rule of law principles within the security and defense forces. Why? Because we realized that uh, abusive use of force uh, when uh, people involved are armed and have no idea whatsoever about international law or rule of law. And, and this is how war explodes. Now, what is being done, and, and that is a, a massive challenge, it's really the establishment within uh, staff structures and within uh, defense and security units, establishing um, documentation for training, uh, educational support, really this training to so that the leadership of these security forces sort of take in this idea of the rule of law. And it has to be accompanied by professional mentoring. Uh, so you have international um, help that comes in to, to goes into these uh, police stations to really sort of support the actions of the Congolese police. And that's really about the reform of the national police in DRC. So we, in turn, we see things progressing very slowly, but they are advancing. What is encouraging is that the Congolese leadership uh, took on this uh, will uh, to undertake reforms with the international community. And this operational support also included the chief of staff, where we've tried to uh, also include our partners and the UN, the, U the European Union, the cooperation from Germany, from the United States and others, to put into place uh, 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 the police operations within a legal framework. And so uh, the an operational change to change the perception uh, that the uh, law enforcement and security must integrate these um, principles, not just for the security of the people, but their own security, because uh, uh, violence begets violence. So it is important for them to understand it is in their own interest, because there are uh, also it's important to have internal mechanisms in place to uh, put a halt to uh, uh, abuses and to establish and support the principles of rule of law uh, throughout the judicial throughout the judicial system. So, in terms of the uh, the challenges in countries where there are internal countries, the main main problem, the main conflict is based on the lack of training so that all persons understand that, that this is integrated, this concept of rule of law is integrated and understood. It is not easy because often there are uh, there are fighters, one has to change the mentality, the perception, the way of seeing things of uh, persons who work within the security forces. So this is a true challenge for these countries in crisis. So um, it is well understood that education training is based uh, for the uh, security and police forces is important not only to assure uh, judicial protections, whether it's the military, the gendarmerie, this also gives uh, both physical and legal protections to uh, the actors of the security forces because there are there are much fewer conflicts when less force is used. And I feel that this is the direction to go in. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, Dr. Theo, really thank you very much. I like the, uh, at least moving from Senegal to the, uh, the fragile state like DRC, an example that, yes, we can make a, we can make a, 
the synergy between the two rule of law and the and the security and see you you provide a very good example and what i would like to uh, the the emphasis on the professionalism and the training and really i would like to to refer to our our participant we have one of our well-read uh, uh, piece of work called the advancing professionalism in security sector in africa by one of our colleagues emil and it's a good document and i think what you said here yeah, is the issue of the knowledge gap and the uh, and the challenges facing the issue of training and how we to integrate rule of law in the professionalism and through training and education this is really a very good a very good example i would like you read really also for the participant there is also another document called the well developed report 2011 and the idea in the fragile state how can you exit from fragility is through through the institutions and building the confidence and then one of the things to to produce by the end of the day is human security, citizen security, employment, and, and, and justice. And I think this is a very good thing that you, uh, thank you very much, uh, because, yeah. Again, I, I know, again, I would like you really to write in your question uh, as we move towards the end of the, uh, the plenary, uh, plenary session. Now, let me move now to Dr. Kelly. Um, uh, I think you have done great work on the rule of law, your research, uh, uh, and then, uh, and because the rule of law, at the heart of many challenges and opportunities that African state face in, in the security domain. Uh, could you give some example of how rule of law shaped the drivers of core threat that Africa state face, as well as how rule of law influences how risk factors for security play out? Uh, please, within six minutes, uh, you're most welcome, please. Okay, yes, Dr. Luca, let me talk about this through two different lenses. So first of all, Rule of law issues are drivers of insecurity in a variety of contexts, and we can see this most clearly in relation to violent extremism, armed conflict, and transnational organized crime. So I'll say some brief words on each. On violent extremism, human rights abuses by security sector actors or perceptions of unjust treatment by government officials more generally are some of the key determinants of individuals' decisions to join violent extremist groups. We've seen this in the Sahel, the Lake Chad Basin, and the Horn of Africa. Um, and some of the research on this, one particularly famous study is the 2017 study by the UNDP, which was done on this in Cameroon, Kenya, Niger, Nigeria, Somalia, and Sudan. And this study compared the life histories of people who joined violent extremist organizations with the life histories of people who had not joined such organizations. And it sought to identify by comparing these two types of people, the tipping point that pushed particular individuals into joining a violent extremist group. And that study showed that 71% of people who joined violent extremist organizations said that the tipping point for them was state security forces killing, arbitrarily jailing, or abusing a family member or a friend. Um, we have another study that came out around the same time by International Alert that was looking specifically at youth recruitment into violent extremist groups in the Liptako-Gorma region. And it concluded that one principal push factor leading youth to join these groups was the experience or perception of abuses perpetrated by various elements of the state. So that could include the security forces at times. Um, so that's one way that rule of law issues and human rights issues play into this security challenge. On armed conflict and violence, weak rule of law can exacerbate existing armed conflicts. There are, of course, many different causes of armed conflicts and civil wars, not all of which are directly related to the rule of law. But the research does show that civil war onset and duration can be influenced by grievances about political, social, or economic conditions. And the rule of law sometimes has the power to shape those kinds of grievances. So risk of conflict can rise when politically salient identity groups face disparities in their access to power um, due to discriminatory practices, for example. That's not always the case, but it, it sometimes is in relation to some of these conflicts. Another example is localized grievances, which arise for a wide variety of reasons, could also play into different logics of political violence. So a key point here for the rule of law is that heavy-handed security responses to conflicts can exacerbate political violence and instability and can have counterproductive effects for conflict resolution. So having strong domestic justice systems, not just state courts, but a wide range of state or non-state mechanisms for alternative dispute resolution can be helpful in resolving disputes or in preventatively addressing some of these grievances 
that might otherwise risk playing into logics of violence under certain conditions of stress. Um, and then finally, on transnational organized crime, you know, today, transnational organized crime in Africa is perpetrated by a variety of actors, foreign entities, uh, loosely affiliated criminal networks, um, more tightly wound um, mafia style groups, but also certain high level officials within African states are sometimes facilitating some of these behaviors. And that's perhaps the most sensitive aspect of transnational organized crime in African contexts. High level government corruption can enable it. And that has been empirically documented through sources like the Enact Consortium's Organized Crime Index. This is true around the world, but there are recent examples from several African countries um, that I won't go into here. Um, but organized crime is easier to perpetrate when there are fewer guardrails against corruption in government. And when the law isn't applied evenly and institutions of transparency and accountability are weak, government officials who may be colluding with criminal networks have very little to fear. So problems can arise if states choose not to enforce existing laws on transnational organized crime, or if they avoid shining light on the big fish in the government who are perpetrating this, um, as opposed to people um, lower down in the criminal network chain. So these practices can subvert the principle that nobody is above the law, and that's how they relate to rule of law. The second way rule of law is critical to security is that it shapes the ways that different continental megatrends influence risk and resilience. So for example, rule of law lies at the heart of challenges and opportunities faced in relation to Africa's unprecedented levels of urbanization and demographic growth. So just quickly, um, in the coming decades, in terms of urbanization, over 80% of Africa's population growth is expected to take place in cities. And that has contributed to the rapid expansion of informal settlements in many of Africa's urban areas and the growing share of urban dwellers living in these informal settlements underscores the urgency of protecting civil liberties and property rights of these citizens. So that would include guarding against heavy handed or at sometimes even exploitative approaches taken by police. Um, attempting to counter crime and violence in some of these communities. So that's another way rule of law plays in. And finally, African security futures will also be shaped by the youth bulge, of course, and that is projected to foster a 50% increase in population by 2035. Youth are frequently underrepresented in formal economies and policymaking processes. And at the same time, they're playing key roles in mobilizing civic movements that are seeking to combat corruption, to strengthen local governance, and to peacefully challenge um, even presidents who may be trying to defy term limits. Rural youth are equally critical for peace building, for mediating disputes, preventing conflict in their localities. So tapping into the rule of law by strengthening the state's provision of better educational, employment, and governance opportunities for youth can help prevent exclude their exclusion and further their peaceful civic engagement. And so that's another way rule of law, equality, and inclusion all matter here in relation to megatrends. I'll stop there, Luca. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Pakat. And I think what you said, the absence of rule of law becoming a main driver, not only the security challenges, internal security challenges, but transnational organized crime. Adhering to this, the rule of law could become a very good driver for stability and, 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 and peace. So really, let, let, let me move now quickly uh, to Dr. Wani. I want you really to conclude this uh, conversation uh, based on your wealth of experience in the security and human rights. And uh, it would be good if you can share with the participants some of the practical challenges that the security sector leaders face in promoting the rule of law system to advance citizen security. And I would like you, if you can just also to provide some practical step that the participants can be able to use to strengthen the rule of law and the effectiveness of security sector. That would be a good way to conclude this uh, conversation, please, within six minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. 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 Luca. I will uh, try to be very brief here because I think if you bring together the points General Chow made and uh, this latest point, we get a lot of things put together and I'll borrow from both of them. Uh, first of all, with respect to the challenges, I think uh, almost all three of us have underscored a number of things. For me, 
the first is uh, the, the the impact of uh, the, the lack of respect for rule of law on the purpose and uh, mission of the security sector. I think that there's a sense in which every little problem in, in African countries now is securitized, and that has led to a situation where the purpose and role of the of the security sector is uh, is ambiguous and is not clear. And that kind of mission creep has uh, inherent dangers. And I think we see it in a lot of situations where uh, it begins to undermine the, the, the status of security. Secondly, there is an impact on legitimacy and credibility. Uh, a lot has been said about that already, but uh, this leads to alienation of the, the citizens from, uh, uh, from the security sector. And you might also hear from people in the security sector that uh, the global community, in fact, tends to be biased towards activists and the human rights sector and therefore that they are hamstrung in some way, they are not able to do uh, their job properly. And that gap between uh, the citizen and uh, the security sector is unhealthy and leads to a lot of what uh, Professor Kelly referred to earlier. There are issues related to the integrity uh, of the security sector itself. When it begins to behave like other institutions of state, and corruption is a very high uh, uh, concern in many of our, in our countries, partisanship, uh, sort of a parochialism in the way in which appointments are made, contracts are awarded, and so on. Uh, a security sector that behaves in that manner cannot effectively uh, perform its role. And I think in that regard, uh, there are serious issues, and I will not get into specific cases here, but there are concerns about the capability of the security sector then to perform the core role that it should, it should play. Now, having said that, what can one do about this very practical? I think part of the, the, the larger context and the challenge that one faces in this regard is that much of what we have discussed here goes far beyond the remit of the security sector. We have issues that are political in nature, issues that are related to, to the economy, questions that are related to the, the, the essence of the state itself, which cannot, of course, be cured by the security sector. But I think that say, nevertheless, the security is a lot that can be done within the leadership of the security sector that can address the problem. And in here, I will borrow a lot uh, from uh, General uh, General Trail. Uh, first of all, I think that this embedding the rule of law and insisting that it is part and parcel of the security sector is a critical thing. Among other things, uh, so and underscoring the point that. It is a creature of law. It's based on the constitution, and you have to stick within the constitutional limits of its uh, of its power. That mission is defined by law. It is not uh, some ambiguous, uh, amorphous thing that changes with the, with the, with the circumstance. That uh, uh, there are checks and balances and accountability within the security sector uh, itself. That the rules are very clear. Rules regarding uh, the, the the deployment of the security sector. Uh, the policies and doctrine, the rules of engagement are very well defined, and every single person who goes out there, I think uh, you know, illustrated that very clearly, you go through crowd control, what are the mechanisms? And obviously training is a very important part of it. We haven't talked about the welfare of the people in the security sector. I had a very, very interesting experience a few years ago when I was uh, doing human rights work in Eastern Africa, and I was uh, in, in, in the northern part of Ethiopia, talking to some police officers, and I said, what is it that your first action when you arrest people is to beat them up? Uh, from the moment of the arrest up to the time you lock them in, people are battered so seriously. And when, when the conversation became a lot more informal, they started telling me, well, you know, it's very difficult here. We don't have transportation. I have to end with that. These guys are going to probably run away, and I'll have difficulties. Therefore, I have to be a bit tougher in the way that I deal with them. And, and, and I think in that, in that context, we have a certain culture that has developed. I don't know how many of you saw the thing from Kenya uh, last week, where uh, uh, just after the graduation of uh, general service unit officers, a number of them were put on video bragging about how they were going to come now into the public and unleash uh, their, the, met out their violence on the civilians that they are going to encounter uh, on the road. I think a very, very clear sense of accountability, of training, the, the uh, 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 systems of oversight and so on within the security sector will be extremely important in reining in and creating a total mindset change. And finally, let me just talk about professionalism as well, because I think that a part and parcel of all of this is the professionalism of the institution, but also of the individual officers and, and, and leadership. 
I, I, I was intrigued as I was preparing for this. I recall sometimes in June last year, when there was a Black Lives Matter movement here in, in, in the United States, and uh, created real tension and, and uh, a debate about when the security sector can be used, when will the military be deployed, and so on. And there was one very interesting incident where the president went into uh, Lafayette Square uh, just as uh, the, the, the security sector was being released on, on civilians, and there were concerns yeah. uh, okay. about abuse. And, and uh, uh, the, the, the chief of staff, okay. the, the chief of general staff was in that, in that meeting. Mm -hmm. a, a few days later, he stood out and offered a public okay. apology. Okay. And very, very strongly stated. So I get your point. I'm supposed to stop there. I appreciate that. <laughs> but, but I think I just wanted to yeah, underscore yeah, the point here yeah, that professional yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Oh, um, yeah, Dr. Obani, I think you, you completed very well. I think some most important thing, the issue of challenges, that the fact that you, uh, the, uh, the secretizations of life is becoming a big challenge. And I think the, uh, the alienation of citizens, I think this is very important in the security sector. And this is one of the things we have been advancing, the issue of citizen security, how the policies are designed and the citizens that need to be, to be included. I like the way you concluded the issue of professionalism and embed, in, embedding the rule of law in the security sector is paramount. So I think with those ones, really, I really would like to thank all of you, the panelists, you have done a great job. I know the time will not be enough for us, and I know there are so many questions. I don't know how I'm going to handle it, but I think you have done a great job, uh, Wani, uh, Tiao, and, uh, and, and Kelly, you did a great job and for, the, uh, for opening up this conversation in a very uh, good way. So now we move to, the, to this question and answer. And uh, uh, so we'll continue to record this meeting as well uh, get, uh, within the context of non-attribution. And you can type in your questions. You have so many questions that you have typed, but you can uh, uh, in the Zoom chat. Uh, so that, uh, and that our panelists will be able to, to, to answer some of these questions. So let me, let me summarize. I don't know to what level I will be able to summarize. There are so many questions. But let me try. First, um, there are so many questions, but not necessarily, but let me summarize them to you so that you can be able to, 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 to answer them. First, um, uh, the, uh, there is, um, I want you to detail, uh, does the process of the democratic crowd control call for the unauthorized demonstration? What attitude? Uh, then should security forces uh, take against the crowd of which is by de facto breaking the law. I think the whole lot of how you manage the crowd and the protest. Um, the, the other one is the uh, is rule, rule, of law, rule of law application and, of, and observant should be devoid of selectivity, perhaps a policy of, of uh, naming the shaming of those in breach could advance its security. I think this is very, a very general uh, one. Um, I think Bala, I think, made a comment about the conflict in principle and practice. The right of citizens to protest or express themselves can conflict with the responsibility to maintain order. It, it can be, it, it, can, it can seem that the right of citizens are lim limitless but the responsibility of the state to contain. I think the, this issue of the, uh, the, 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 the conflict of principle and the practice, I think it's a challenge. It would be good if you can highlight some of the points. And I think he provides some example from Nigeria as well. And I, uh, I think also Bala may, uh, continue the same discussion about the position of rule of law and use of force as a legitimacy. Uh, I think the whole lot of use of rule of law and the, and, and the, and the use of force, I think it would be good to highlight on that one. Uh, I think in the, in, the, in the military conflict, I think somebody is raising a question about the rule of law, the rule of law is, up, is applied in a way that does not respect uh, human dignity, which violates the basic principle. I think it would be good that they are to look at the issue of how you can apply the rule of law in the context of the, uh, of the fragile state where, where there's a conflict. How do we guarantee rule of law in Africa when so many governments are still undergoing unconstitutional regime change? This is a big thing. It's about all of, in a transition, well, how best how can we use the rule of law in terms of uh, introducing rule of law while these countries are undergoing 
and constitutional regime change. I mean, I think uh, Dr. Dr. Wani, you mentioned about the issue of the, the tenure of uh, the, the constitutionalism and how can we introduce the rule of law in such a context. Uh, um, maybe this one to, 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 to Dr. Piao of for why does ECOWAS, which is, which is made of countries that have a strong rule of law like Senegal, for instance, not have the solution to bring other member states to follow rule of law in the security sector. I think this is about the, the role of the, uh, the regional mechanism in, in, in embedding the security, I mean, the rule of law in the security sector, but in, not only within, with, within the member state of the, of the region. It would be good if you can, um, 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 we can uh, comment on that one. Uh, uh, comment in Francophone Africa, the, the, the judicial tradition is inspired by funds from this perspective. Is it appropriate to consider a frame uh, judicial system as a legitimate? I think the whole lot of the legacy of the colonial power in the way we, the, we, we provide, the, uh, we understand the rule of law. Um, uh, what else? Let me see. So the questions, oh wow. So I have some questions here in, uh, so anyhow, so, so these are some of the questions. Uh, let me see. Okay, these are some very large number of questions. So let me give you a chance to, to respond uh, in that order. Let me start with uh, uh, Dr. Piao for some of the questions raised. Uh, it's not just only to give, I think, uh, what is the good? We are going to continue the same, yeah. I think. Uh, Merci beaucoup pour, yeah. uh, Thank you very much for these questions. I'm, I'm going to try and provide an overall response and taking into account all, all the points that were raised. So the first aspect associated to uh, the respect of community law. Now, in West Africa, you have in constitutional governments, uh, you know, regime transitions. Uh, so this whole issue of uh, unconstitutional governments. Now, how do you apply rule of law in these contexts? Now, in my experience in the security and defense sector, I'm not going to go in, 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 into an overall perspective on unconstitutional uh, transitions. But from my point of view, and Dr. Wani already mentioned it, it's uh, an issue about very precise, specific regulations. Now, in, within ECOWAS, um, the majority of the countries um, have a French tradition, except for Ghana and Nigeria. So this understanding of human rights, it's, it's, it's still all the same, be it a Francophone or Anglophone tradition. The, the principles of human rights are the same, um, you know, regardless, inalienable rights. Now, in the case of ECOWAS, there is a code of conduct for armed forces and, and defense forces in Africa. This was adopted in 2011, nearly 10 years ago. This code talks about how the regulatory framework must be defined regarding civil or military relations, um, the relations between armed forces and civilian populations, um, human rights and security forces. It's really a text that is very educational, very detailed. Uh, unfortunately, it has not been um, circulated enough. And so efforts must be made. And this links up to another issue, respecting human dignity, uh, respect for the rights of citizens. Citizens have the right to protest, to march. But these rights must be applied within a framework because this balance between the respect uh, of rights and, and maintaining order, uh, there, there is a, a balance to keep between these two and you have to have the right balance. 
And so the question is how, you know, there was a question about unauthorized protest. And so it is under the authority of civil authorities. So if the prefect, the governor, thinks that a, a protest on a particular street is going to stop people from exercising their freedoms, going to work, going home. Um, so if, if this authority feels that they should forbid this march or protest at a certain time, uh, they have the right to do so. And, and the security forces will work to apply these rules handed down by civilian authorities, keeping in mind that they must make minimal use of force in this context. So, you know, we talked about the gradual, very progressive use of force. And so this gradual use of force includes negotiation, saying to the leaders of a march, of a protest, okay, you have rights, but as citizens, you have the obligation of respecting the law, and the law is the order given by the civilian authority. And so uh, citizens with goodwill will listen to this. There can be instances where, where people say no, um, in spite of what uh, the administration says, we're going to protest. But it's important, nevertheless, to try to find a compromise between uh, the forces okay. of order okay. and the uh, okay. citizens, civilians. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Kukel. I think um, uh, Dr. Kukel will continue the conversation afterwards. But let us let me give uh, maybe for some few minutes, uh, Dr. Wani just only to, to answer in a generic way, generally, uh, some of the questions raised. Uh, I think it was in a very uh, within some few minutes. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Luca. I will indeed be very generic in my response, and I'll address three three very general questions. One is the point about uh, the balance, the tension between the right to protest and the responsibility of the state to maintain mm -hmm. security. I, yeah. I, I think I can't add much more to what uh, General Kiel said here. Uh, in fact, at the normative level, there's already been a lot of work by the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, for example, and the Human Rights Committee, the Committee on Economic, Social, Cultural Rights, to try to provide guidance on where that can be done. And in brief, it is somewhere in between. You cannot have an absolute prohibition. The use of force cannot be your default position, but and you have to allow. It. There is a very, very practical guidance that can be applied in this regard. And I think that uh, that underscores the point about training and professionalism. One, one needs to spend a bit, rather than just throwing the security forces on the ground and say, you go and control the crowd. You have to internalize the issue of the, 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 the rights of the individual. Secondly, on the question of fragile states, there has been an increasing debate here. There's a group called the G7 Plus. These are fragile states, conflict uh, states that are coming out of conflict. And the argument is made that they should be gradually integrated into the, into the rule of law. And some countries are, in fact, trying to bring them into conversations about how they can set up the building blocks for the respect of the rule of law. I've always been uh, against this because I think that, that in fact what we are talking about are really fundamental very basic principles and you can be gradual about the aspect of rights, about the rule of law. Uh, but nonetheless, there is recognition of the challenges that fragile states do encounter and an effort to try to uh, provide special mechanisms for them. And finally, on the issue of uh, human rights being alien, uh, French or uh, my sense, yes, at some level, indeed, we have inherited laws and we haven't done a very good job of domesticating them. But with respect to the basic principles of the rule of law and the issues of human rights, my submission would be that, in fact, they are really very fundamental universal things to a large extent. And some of the issues that we are concerned about here, the issues that really anguish us a lot, do not have much to do with the, uh, the, the sophisticated sort of differences about, you know, uh, we're following European or, or the Roman law as opposed to customary principles of law. Basic issues about the right to life, about your freedom of association, freedom of speech, I submit those are very universal and very important. Thank you. Oh, oh great point. Uh, uh, Dr. Rowani, and I think we'll 
These are some of the issues we, 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 we carry them forward for our conversation. This is the beginning of conversation, the rule of law, you know, and we have started it. And I know my colleague uh, had, has a, 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 a big challenge in all of us in Africa since then, what should we do differently in order to promote the rule of law? And I agree with you, the, uh, the fundamental rule of law as applicable to all situation and there's no exemption. We recognize the challenge in some situation, uh, as you said in the plurality said, but it doesn't mean that we should actually, the rule of law should be a fundamental issues of how you can build the state itself. So, so uh, can, if you can just briefly, general, so that we can move to your, the conversation, to the, uh, to the, uh, the open, uh, open discussion, please welcome uh, in some few minutes, please. Sure. Um, I'll be brief because I think Dr. Roswani and Chiao did a good job of addressing um, generally um, the range of questions that we had coming in. Um, and we can discuss some further for anyone who stays for the open discussion. Um, I think um, to add on to what was said, um, there was the question of, um, let's see here, how to maintain rule of law when seeing unconstitutional regime changes. Um, I think that that's a really big and difficult question. But um, certainly uh, we know that it's against the rule of law. It's, it's treason to take down an elected, a democratically elected government um, through that kind of transition. And there needs to be um, one rule of law consideration is how can there be accountability for that? So um, I think that's one question that um, you know, security actors and civil society and citizens in general may have on their minds in, in, in situations like that. And that does relate back to basic rule of law principles I think also for citizens to stay engaged in their commitment to the rule of law and for security sector actors who are committed to those ideals to continue even in difficult situations, um, working towards change and fostering change on a policy level um, and through legal means. Um, and so I think it's a really difficult um, set of situations that we've seen um, in, in relation to what has happened with coups and unconstitutional regime changes over the last year in particular. Um, in, in, in Africa, um, but I think um, remaining wedded to some of these rule of law principles while working through how accountability uh, will work and how um, we get back to democratically elected governments is going to remain very important. It's not an easy question to answer though, I will admit. Um, so I wanted to talk about that. And then someone asked, um, can we have rule of law without an independent judiciary? And I would say that of course, the independence of the judiciary from the executive branch is a really important feature of having a strong and robust rule of law. Um, I think some key things to think about in that arena that I'm sure the alumni could discuss much further is um, how the Conseil Supérieur de la Magistrature or how entities um, in either um, kinds of legal systems that promote, um, that, that create rules for the promotion of judges and prosecutors. I'm thinking about how those bodies can be independently uh, functioning um, and functioning independently of the executive branch in particular. I think in some countries you see executive branch officials um, stacked or into those institutions or having the majority sort of decision making power there. And I think the more independent these rules for promotion and advancement in judicial careers can be, um, the more easily it is to sort of promote an independent judiciary overall. So I think there are definitely some hard, again, hard questions there. Um, to deal with, but I do think that that's one way to think further about um, how we create independent judiciaries and reinforce um, some of these mechanisms that are really important for having a rule of law in the long run that's that's strong and robust. I'll leave it there. Yeah, oh, thank you very much. And I, I think, let me thank three of you. You have done a great job. As we said in Africa Center, did the conversation where we started. And I think today is the beginning of our conversation. And I think your question is a reflection that is a very important issue that we need to bring uh, to, to the discussion, the issue of rule of law in the security sector. Two things or three conclusions that I want to make. First, the rule of law is so fundamental in the way we, we, we intend to deliver security to citizens. It is, it is a driver for the stability and, and, uh, and, and security in, in our continent. I think there is there's a convergence, there is a synergy between the rule of law and human rights. In fact, the perceived, the perceived threat of we are seeing between human rights and security, it is because the way we perceive security as regime security or state security. And if we move our attitude towards citizen security, then citizen becoming a key player in the, uh, in the terms of rule of law and how they can advance it in the security sector. I think we have a lot of challenges of the knowledge gaps in terms of professionalism, in terms of education, 
And these are the things we need to embed it. They, uh, the role of security in security sector through different aspects, either through training, through constitutional process, or through the, uh, the, uh, the professional, advanced professionalism. I think that what, 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 what is coming out from here, the rule of law is so relevant in the context of fragility and conflict, as well in a stable situation. It is fundamental for us. So with that one, I really, I would like to thank all of you. I like to thank the participants. I like to thank the, the, the panelists, your great questions. And, I, uh, and, uh, and, and, and we are so happy that you have joined us. And, uh, and we have our next webinar will be in April, uh, in April, July, September. Uh, and my colleague uh, Khan will be updating you on that. We encourage you to continue this, this debate. In case you are interested to continue the conversation, um, uh, we will now host an, like a one hour long open discussion about today's webinar topic. And after five minutes, perhaps we'll, after we'll give you five minutes and all alumni are welcome to stay on and participate via video if they wish. If you wish to participate, please raise your hand and the raise hand function in Zoom uh, uh, menu, will, will, you can use that one and we'll be able to, we'll be, we'll be enabling your, your video. So let me stop here and really I just want to thank you all